Hi everyone, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to have a quick introduction. Uh, so my name is Aisha Fruit. I'm a junior. I majored in healthcare and pre-cal, uh, which is philosophy, politics, econ, and law. Um, and so I did this internship because it tied into both of my majors. Um, it helped me understand the judicial system from a public health standpoint. Um, and so I interned at the Arlington Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court, and I was a judicial intern there. And I'll take you through a couple things um, that I saw and toured during my time there. So again, this is the Arlington Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court. And surprisingly, it was only like 10 minutes away from uh, my house, so I literally just walked to work every morning. <laughs> it's very convenient. Um, so during my time here, uh, I went to group homes. Um, and there's two group homes, Argus and Aurora House for girls and boys. Um, there's the Girls Outreach Program, which does a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling with girls. Uh, I visited the Juvenile Detention Center. Um, I had a chance to shadow a GAL, which is like a garden of item. Uh, and I had a chance to do a personal home visit with her. Um, and I also uh, reviewed vouchers for GALs and attorneys, which gave me an idea of the kind of time they spend on cases, um, especially GALs, um, that 30 minutes they spend interviewing kids um, regarding who is like the best parent for custody cases. Um, so it was all really interesting. Um, but the biggest reason why I did this was to uh, study human trafficking and learn it a little more better. I took daughter, Dr. Dada's class uh, on human trafficking and modern day slavery. Um, and so I just wanted to, um, I was hoping to see human trafficking cases come up in this court. Um, so that was one of the re main reasons why I did it. And so, oops. And so today, um, I wanna share a story that um, I heard in this court. Um, I heard this story as court was ending and as the judge was heading out after finishing her work. Um, an attorney came in through the door with an emergency removal hearing for the judge. And this was the first time I had seen such a petition coming in, so I remained in my seat to hear this case. And as the attorney told untold snippets of this case of a young girl who was trapped by a couple, I was stunned and shocked. Um, during Dr. Dada's SSIR, we visited multiple victims, but just standing there in the courtroom and just kind of seeing it all unfold, it kind of like shocked me and stunned me. Um, and I looked towards the judge and saw her mouth agape, and then I looked towards the uh, sheriff to the right side of the judge, and again, she had like disgusted facial expressions crossing her face, and it was really odd. Um, even after hearing disturbing cases for years, I'm sure, for the judge and the sheriff, uh, this particular case I could see like a nerve them along with me and during the first few weeks of interning at the juvenile and domestic relations court one of the biggest lessons I learned or observed was the way the legal professionals separated their judgments emotions and opinions from their cases when presenting them and hearing them um, however this case it just seemed impossible to do so like you would have to be human not to do that um, and so the victim in this case, a young girl was abused and exploited in every form possible. Um, she was physically abused and the condition that she was found was evidence of that. Um, this couple reduced her to a slave and kept her confined in the house. They did not enroll her in school. Um, and the shocking thing was, despite them having a child of their own, this couple was able to inflict so much pain and abuse towards this young girl. Um, just like the lack of judgment this couple showed towards this young girl despite being parents themselves, like it completely stunned me and shocked me. Um, however, the prudence of the community member who brought light to this issue amazed me. She had seen this girl wandering the streets barefoot and distressed, and this neighbor acted on that gut instinct, which said that something was not right. As soon as she saw the girl, she could have easily put it off and told herself to not get involved or that the next person will do something about it. Um, but had she done this, this young girl could have continued living the way she was. Um, and, that, and, that and, that, and that decision that that neighbor made in that moment to act on something that seemed off to her changed the life this girl would continue to live now. Um, and so, although it is a very disturbing case, I just think about that neighbor and how she just took that minute to like call in um, for help and she like followed on her gut instinct. 
So this case just really stunned me, shocked me, but also um, is very special to me because it reaffirms what I learned in Dr. Dada's um, SSIR class. Um, and so I hope that this story encourages everyone to act when they come across a similar situation. Um, I encourage everyone to not walk past it, to not ignore it, to do their best to say that, um, to do their best to not say that someone else will see it. Because the truth is that by living in a community and by seeing something happen in it, you are already involved. If there is that mentality that someone else will see it and do something about it, then who's to say that next person that does see it won't say the same thing? And so now that I have told you this story, which is like really special to me, um, it kind of reaffirms um, my passion for fighting against human trafficking and educating everyone for what it is. Um, and one detail I left out is when I heard this case, I like took a whole class, I took a whole year studying human trafficking. But even after hearing the case, it took me a minute. I was like, this is like a human trafficking case. Um, and I don't think any of the attorneys, um, the GALs, or the social workers identified it as human trafficking. So just like putting the factors and pieces together and saying, hey, this is a human trafficking case, um, it just kind of put the big puzzle in the piece. Um, so now um, the girl has some place in foster care away from her home situation. Um, she's currently enrolled in school, um, learning English, um, getting caught to the grade level that she needs to be in. Um, and I saw the interpreter in this case, and the little girl grew really close to the interpreter. And I've seen so many interpreters in like court cases, and they're very objective, just only translating what the judge is saying back to the attorney. So it's very special seeing this little girl um, form a bond with the interpreter. Um, another organization that got involved in this case was the Department of Homeland Security. Um, passports were seized um, so the couple could go back to their original country. Um, and once again, it reaffirmed the signs that Dr. Dalla taught me about um, regarding human trafficking. Um, so these are some of the signs, but I'll just go through a couple that were especially evident in this case, um, which was, um, again, lack of eye contact. Um, lack of passports or identification documents. Um, again, fearful, that anxiousness. I think back to how that neighbor saw this little girl wandering around the streets, distressed, barefoot. So that's kind of what I got out of my internship and um, the organizations that I visited during my SSR um, included like the National Human Trafficking Center, Polaris, the National uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, I saw all these organizations come back into play and work on this court case. So um, that was my experience at the Juvenile and Domestic Relations for 